Uh, hello, um, my name is Gus Minch. I'd like to welcome you to the inaugural uh, Seamless Astronomy Colloquium. Um, it was about five years ago when Alyssa and I were both working on projects at the Institute for Innovative Computing at Harvard where we sort of began to conceptualize a, a seamless astronomy group at the Center for Astrophysics that would combine all the different software and research intersections that happen at a large place like this. Um, the seamless astronomy group has now grown. It's now funded uh, through grants from NASA and NSF, um, Microsoft Research, and the Center for Astrophysics supports our work. Um, and it's now an intersection of, 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 of teams really ranging from the uh, Wolbach Library to the ADS team um, to the Virtual Observatory software development that has been going on across the world um, and to our own projects that you'll hear some about today. Now the talk today by Alyssa is on visualization and astronomy, but the Seamless Astronomy Group over the past five years has been working to bring you uh, many other things other than uh, visualization tools. Um, we've tried to introduce you to uh, uh, software projects that might be useful for your research, um, archival data tools, um, science education um, tools uh, such as Worldwide Telescope. And um, we hope that this, this, this is the inaugural colloquium series. We hope that this um, uh, series, which we'll, we plan to happen uh, a couple times a semester, will bring you other uh, topics and, and things that will um, be of use and interest to you. Um, uh, just so you know, this is being streamed uh, live on the, on the web, and it's also being recorded, um, and thanks to the, the CF for their work on that, and it's being recorded by um, HarvardX as a possible, as a, as a, uh, um, a lecture that can be used in uh, edX courses. Um, and if you're on the web streaming um, this, and if you have any questions, please send them to Twitter. Uh, our speaker today is uh, Alyssa Goodman, who I believe most of you know very well. Um, I'm not going to give her any other introduction other than to say uh, this is a good one on visualization and astronomy. Thank you, Gus. Thanks. So thank you, everybody, for coming at this slightly unusual time. Um, <coughs> and what I'm going to do today is, as Gus mentioned, try to explain the visualization aspects of our uh, seamless astronomy program here. But I want to put them in the context of not just you know, how do you make beautiful pictures that attract attention, but instead how do you use visualization to actually understand um, the information that you've gathered and that you're trying very hard to get some kind of physical insight from. And this title slide gives you a sense of the kinds of topics I will cover. And for some of you, I would imagine that those logos and little icons are familiar, but for others of you, they're not. Um, and uh, my goal is that by the end of the talk, uh, they will be. And uh, for anybody who wants to just take out your phone, take this little picture here, you can get the handout uh, digitally, which is in the back of the room, that has a list of many, many links uh, to many uh, useful websites and tools that I'm going to mention um, in the talk. And I'll, I'll show that again at the end. Now, before I get started, I have to explain that in addition to the Seamless Astronomy Group here that Gus mentioned, um, there are many particularly uh, key members of that group and also uh, outside collaborators who, picture, uh, who are pictured uh, right here. And so uh, some of these people are, are in the room, uh, notably uh, Chris Beaumont, who's over there. I uh, can't see in the dark. Maybe Nathan is here. Maybe Elizabeth Newton. I can't see. Anyway, these are people well known to you, and uh, their contributions will come up uh, during the talk. OK, so now let me actually get started. And um, I've shown this slide many times. And it's probably the most important thing to appreciate from the talk, which is that some people have an impression of uh, visualization as something that would be unnecessary if only we could make computers smart enough. And that may be true, but the important point is that computers are nowhere near smart enough. Okay? And smart enough is defined as, as smart as us. Okay? And so what humans have evolved to do is recognize patterns very quickly. Okay? you know, astron astronomy results are unlikely to be uh, chasing you and trying to kill you, but the same uh, cognitive systems in your brain that let you very quickly, you know, pick out a cheetah running at you in the grass, let you pick out a bubble in the interstellar medium, okay? So we are better at this than computers. Computers, on the other hand, are tremendously better than us at making very large, complicated calculations. And I'll show you later some examples where you really leverage these two things off each other. And that's a lot of the goal um, of what I'm going to be showing you today. Okay, so with that sort of framework in mind, 
let's get started and let's start with Galileo. Okay? So I'm guessing that in this audience, these pictures are probably familiar to many of you, um, in case they're not. Uh, this is Galileo's notebook from 1610. And over here, he's making some notes. And down here, he's drawing some pictures mixed in with the notes. And the pictures show you his first telescopic observations of Jupiter. So I'm guessing that all of you know that Galileo was the first person to take a telescope and look at astronomical objects. And one of the things that he decided to look at was Jupiter. And he noticed that there were some dots next to Jupiter that he, of course, thought were stars because they were other planets were not known to have moons. And he said, hmm, these seem to be moving in some odd way. And he's making notes here. And then he cleans up his notes and turns them into what we would now call a time series. And in visualization, you would call small multiples. Okay, so these little boxes here are the 7th of January, the 8th, the 10th, it was cloudy on the 9th, uh, the 11th, the 12th, etc. Okay, and he's saying this is Jupiter. And then these other things are I don't know what, but they seem to be moving. It's an interesting story that when the book was eventually published as Sidereus Nuncius, the actual positions of those asterisks that you see there, if you try to reconstruct the orbits of Jupiter from that, you get the wrong answer. And this is a very good example of the limitations of technology for communicating visualization. His hand-drawn notes are far more accurate than that because the printing press couldn't put the little <laughs> symbols um, in the right place. But so Galileo started us in really uh, this partnership between human cognitive system and visualization and astronomy and astrophysical discovery. And so this is 400 years ago. And so what I want to show you now is this is great what Galileo did, but I want to show you what you can do with a modern tool like Worldwide Telescope to try to really understand and explain uh, what Galileo did. And so I'm going to show you some excerpts, some video experts, uh, excerpts from what is actually uh, a very interactive tour that explains Galileo's uh, discovery of Jupiter's moons. And so I'm going to let this play for a minute. Um, and uh, when Galileo published his talk. findings in his famous book, The Starry Messenger, this is what he said about his observations. On the seventh day of January in the present year 1610, at the first hour of night when I was viewing the heavenly bodies with the telescope, Jupiter presented itself to me. Beside the planet there were three starlets, small indeed but very bright. Though I believed them to be among the host of fixed stars, they roused my curiosity somewhat by appearing to lie in an exact straight line. There were two stars on the eastern side and one to the west. The most easterly star and the western one appeared larger than the other. I paid no attention to the distances between them and Jupiter, for at the outset I thought them to be fixed stars. The next night, things got interesting. Returning to the same investigation on January 8th, led by what, I do not know, I found a very different arrangement. The three starlets were now all to the west of Jupiter, closer together and at equal intervals from one another. This arrangement interested Galileo not only because it was different than the previous night, but also because the points of light around Jupiter did not appear to move in exactly the same way as Jupiter did relative to the visible stars. Now, I'll show you Worldwide Telescope several times, but I just want to make a personal note that the way that this tour was made, Pat Udomperser, who I forgot to mention on the first slide, runs the Worldwide Telescope Ambassadors Program here, which is an outreach program based on the computer program Worldwide Telescope. And she got to actually, you'll notice that it says there that it's uh, the 7th of January in 1610 under observing time. And so within Worldwide Telescope, you can manipulate the sky to look like it would look at any particular time and then overlay graphics the way that you saw. So this is all, again, made in a program that will come up many times in this talk. But let me just show you a little bit more of that tour. Galileo understood that if he could have observed Jupiter without interruption by daylight or poor weather, he would have seen this. Today we can see Galileo's correct picture from many perspectives, including a calculated view of Jupiter and its moons as seen from above. These modern images are taken from space. The most important perspective Galileo offered on Jupiter and its moons was actually about the Earth and its moon. In Galileo's day, people had difficulty understanding how the Earth could keep its moon in tow if it orbited the sun. Newton's theory of gravity was not published until 1687, 77 years after Galileo's first observations of Jupiter. 
But even without a detailed understanding of gravity, Galileo's results showed that a planet could, in fact, hold on to its... Okay, so I cut it off there, but you can see that you go from Galileo's visualization of little sketches to a plane of the sky view where the moons are going back and forth to a three-dimensional view explaining why it is that things look like they're going back and forth on the sky. Okay, so that's where we've come in 400 years. But to show you what happened in between, okay, so here's Galileo in 1610. And all sorts of other interesting things happened along the way. This is a plot um, of the density of important developments in uh, graphics and visualization as a function of time. And I'd love to go into the details, but I'll skip them for you. And instead, I'll just focus on what happened here in the 1800s, and then I'll come back to the present. Okay, so in the 1800s, uh, two giants, uh, one of whom, Playfair, who invented what would, we would call statistical graphics today, and Menard, what a lot of people would call uh, information visualization, was invented by him, um, lived and worked as engineers and draftsmen and a lot of other things uh, in the 19th century. And the kinds of graphics that they made look like this. And the reason <coughs> that this is really important is because the 1800s was the first time when you could mass produce graphics and you could print them in color. Okay? And so these are beautiful color lithographs, the reproductions of these kind of graphics. For example, when I say Playfair invented statistical graphics, he invented the bar chart. Okay? Somebody had to invent that. He also invented line graphs. Okay? Menard was more of a, um, a map-focused um, person, but you can see these kinds of uh, diagrams that you see now of trade routes and things like that were developed um, in the middle of the 18th century. Okay, so this was beautiful and visualization was headed in a very good direction. And then what happened? There was kind of a peak, this sort of golden age of visualization, and then things started going really bad. Um, and why they went really bad is a good question, but let's leave that for another time and just point out that computers enter science around here. And uh, you may remember that there used to be drafts people who made graphics for you, and, and they were really good at it, okay? And, and they had a certain uh, craftsmanship, a certain ethos and aesthetic that they wanted to apply to the graphics. Computers did not have that, okay? And computer graphics, computer visualization was very ugly um, for quite some time. But what's happened recently is that it's become possible to take tools that are made by people who are really good at uh, both sharing information um, and, uh, in, in a quantitative way and also being very visual and mash them up. So how many people know what mash up means when it refers to music? A few of you. And how many people know what mash up means when it refers to software? F roughly the same people. That's very interesting. Okay. So anyway, what it means is if you have a program that can talk to another program or that can plug inside of another program, that you can build on things that other people already made. So the same way that someone invented the bar graph, and then to reuse a bar graph, you just draw a bar graph. It used to be hard if somebody invented some kind of software to reuse their software. It's become much easier to do that. And so what I'm going to show you today is essentially a stack of things. Um, these are worldwide telescopes, something about 3D PDFs, some software called Glue, something else called C3PO, an ADS All Sky Survey. I'm going to show you how these things connect to each other to make kind of a new ecosystem uh, for doing research and, in particular, uh, visualization. Okay. So, how many of you have ever seen one of these in real life? Those who have small children or who really like electronics. Okay, so what that is is a box where you know, some of these things are like resistors and capacitors and transistors and propellers. And it's a very modular, literally snap together way to make and experiment with electronic circuits. And so when I say software mashup, think of something like that, okay? But think of tools that go all the way from the most basic thing like a resistor, so you know, Python, to a sophisticated thing uh, like a propeller. Okay, which is some of this other software here. And you can put these things together to make all kinds of different objects with the same tools. And so let me just show you an example, of a few pages of examples of what these sort of web 2.0 mashups in visualization look like. Okay, so this is a program called <coughs> Plotly. Um, that's an online uh, data visualization program that we're actually using in my uh, Art of Numbers undergraduate course here at Harvard. Um, and then the next few pages are from something called D3 or D3.js, which is a suite of JavaScript tools that can make all these different kinds of plots. And you'll notice that these plots look a little bit nicer than your typical plot in the Astrophysical Journal. And so we could all be using these tools 
and hopefully more of you will be using them um, after today. But let me come now to this question of big data that comes up all the time. Okay, so you've probably noticed that the popular media has caught on to the idea that there must be something to big data, and this is very trendy and snazzy. And we, of course, in astronomy have our own um, big data sets, and, and we are popular with the media sometimes for providing uh, this big data. But I want to point out that there's another concept, and I, I give credit for the name of this concept to Chris Beaumont, who's sitting over there, which is wide data. Okay, where you have a diversity of different kinds of information that you'd really like to combine. And sometimes it's hard to gather that information and often it's hard to visualize that information together. So I'm going to talk about both of these things. But let me give you an example of big data and this partnership between humans and computers that I talked about earlier. So this image in the background some of you may recognize as uh, the output of something called the Milky Way Project, which is a citizen science project where People are shown images, like this one, okay, here, and uh, they have a choice of do you see a bubble, do you see a star cluster, what do you see, okay? And so they can draw bubbles. If they see what they think is a bubble in the interstellar medium, they can use a tool and they can mark it. And in order to do that, they're using their brain. They're using their cognitive system, which I mentioned is better than a computer um, a priori at doing something like that. But of course, I'm talking about big data. Okay? So you don't necessarily want to rely on humans to find every bubble. And you also don't know how reliable humans are or how similar one human is to the next. So what you really want to do is leverage these things and do something called human-aided computing. Okay? So what does that mean? That means that you take, for example, in this example, which again is the work of Chris Beaumont, you take the output of a project like a citizen science universe project to mark the bubbles. And so this is a set of examples that are labeled here A that are very good examples of these bubbles we're looking for. B is sort of okay examples and C is terribly lame examples. Okay? But all of these things were found by humans okay, who identified them as bubbles. But what you can do is you can take those things and you can use that output as the input to a machine learning algorithm. And in this case that algorithm is called Brute. And uh, Chris can tell you afterwards all about the details of how it works, but importantly, it works entirely inside of a computer using input that is essentially the visual uh, system of, of humans. And so what happens? Okay, well, two things happen. One is that you actually do discover some of the same things that were discovered by people, but you also discover new things. And importantly, you can quantify how sure the algorithm is that something is a bubble. So these things that say p greater than 0.9, for example, mean that they're uh, very certain uh, to be bubbles, and p less than 0.5 is like, oh, I'm not so sure. Okay, and the pink ones are new. But very importantly, marking bubbles in an image like this is not something that even humans can do perfectly. And over here, what you can do is you can show, this is a sample, every line there is a single bubble extracted from the data shown to experts, okay? Actual, not citizen scientists, but actual experts about the structure of the interstellar medium. And where you see a blue line all the way across, that means everyone agrees it's a bubble. If you saw a red line all the way across, everybody would agree it was not a bubble. But what you see a lot of is this kind of, I don't know, this orange category. And then in some cases, you see a lot of red and a lot of orange, like I don't think so. But remember, every line there was identified as a bubble by the Citizen Science Project. And if you go look at this paper, you'll see that you can actually correlate how sure experts are with how sure the algorithm is and do even better um, uh, to calibrate an automatic bubble finding routine that could look at seriously large data sets. So I hope you see there that the human cognition is a key step in the, in the computational process. Okay, so what about if you have big data and wide data? Okay. Um, I'm going to come back to that in just a second, but because that's really our problem a lot of the time. But let me just show you for a brief moment what I mean by wide data. Okay. So this is just a, a slide that some of you have seen several times uh, showing a, an overlay of many different kinds of data uh, from the complete survey of star forming regions, showing you uh, radio spectral line data as contours on top of a background image, on top of catalogs of young stars. And you have a sort of combined uh, set of information that you'd like to intercompare. And this kind of overlay is the typical visualization that you see um, to try to uh, understand how these things relate to each other. But 
Just keep in mind this particular data set when I come back to talking about glue later. Okay, but this is what I mean by wide data. And then I promised I would show you an example of a case where you have big and wide data. And I know we have plenty of uh, theorists and simulators in the audience, so let me choose an example uh, from simulations. These are some movies uh, from uh, Volker Springle, where you see many different quantities, dark matter density, uh, you know, shocks, et cetera, six different quantities uh, plotted here for a simulation um, of the formation of a cluster of galaxies over time. Okay? So there's a lot of information in that one plot. And actually, normally in visualization, you would discourage people from using a different color table in every panel. Okay? But here, it actually helps you remember which one is which. And you can watch this over and over again and compare one thing to another. But still, you'd rather interact with it. Keep that in mind. Okay. All right, so before I go on to talking about additional tools for dealing with these challenges, I want to just remind you that astronomers tend to think of different kinds of graphs as disconnected from each other. So they don't think about often how spectra relate to images, how they relate to 3D movies, et cetera. Okay? So the thing you just saw was four-dimensional in that it was a time series of volumes. Okay? But if you go backwards and just think for a minute, about a 1D slice through an imaginary cube of data. Okay? In astronomy, a column through a cube of data like that is usually a spectrum, a spectral energy distribution, or maybe a time series. It's just an XY plot of something versus something else. Okay? And often it's flux versus wavelength. Okay? But then, if you think about looking at this cube in two dimensions, say from this front view, okay, You'd either see the face of the cube, the sum along the cube, or a slice through the cube. And those are usually portrayed as images. Okay? But in fact, right, say that this was a cube of um, spectrally resolved images, right? then any line through there is still a spectrum. And so sometimes you have the case right, where you actually have all three dimensions. You have a volume, say, <coughs> of uh, spectral line data, for example. Right? And then your choices for showing that are like 3D renderings or 2D movies, some of which I'll show you in just a moment. And then if you have 4D data, okay, you do the kind of thing I just showed you a minute ago uh, from Volker Springle's data where you show um, movies changing in time. Okay, so now let's look at some wide data that is one of these 3D cubes. Okay? So I, showed you that, I told you that we would come back to this image. And the way that you see it here, the green contours, are showing you the sum of emission in the carbon monoxide molecule along the line of sight. Okay? But that's hiding information about where along the line of sight that carbon monoxide emission comes from. And we actually have that information, or at least we have information about the velocity along the line of sight. And so remember I said that 3D data, you could show it as a 2D movie. So if I slide this here, okay, this is just a movie, and that white fluff is showing you slices through the cube, channel maps, okay? And the white fluff adds up to the green contours, okay? So those 2D slices add up to the full volume. But I would argue that it's extremely hard to see what's going on other than that there's some sort of overall velocity gradient in this thing. But it's hard for your brain to put that back together into a three-dimensional picture. So several years ago now, we partnered with um, some people in the medical imaging world, and we did this project where we started experimenting uh, using medical imaging tools on data like this. So here, you see the same data, but now you can holistically see how all the information fits together, and you can see arcs, and you can see spikes and outflows, and what you'd really like is to be able to put those stars back in there in 3D, if only we knew their distances or their velocities. But anyway, um, you certainly can understand the pattern of the gas emission much better from something like this. Now, I'm guessing that some of you are saying, well, that's nice, but you're not going to stand there while somebody's reading your paper and move the mouse around and slide the data around and explain this to them. And that's true. Okay? So there's this very important question of what do we publish. Now, let me just step back for a second and give you some perspective on um, what we've done in the past. Okay? So you're probably familiar uh, with Sidereus Nuncius, which I mentioned at the beginning. Um, so that was published in 1610. It was published as a book, a monograph by Galileo. It had these diagrams that I showed you on the early slide. And very interestingly, the diagrams were integrated with the text. You notice it doesn't say figure one, figure two, etc. 
Try this in the app, Jay, right now. Even that would be difficult. Okay. Anyway, then 1665 comes along, and the first scholarly article is published in the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society. Okay. If I blew that up for you and told you it was a page from the APJ and turned it to be not yellow, you would believe me. Okay, so not much has changed uh, since 1665. Uh, 1895, the spectroscopists broke off from the astronomers and they started the Astrophysical Journal. Okay, so it's been since 1895 that we've had that journal. And it looks pretty much the same as uh, 1665. So no wonder you would ask, well, what do you do with that kind of um, 3D uh, medical imaging uh, result that I showed you earlier? So some of you know um, that in 2009, uh, we did do something with that. And in fact, what we did was we published it in Nature as the first interactive uh, 3D PDF. And so what do I mean by that? This is a little section of that same molecular cloud um, that I showed you before. And the paper, which is not important for today's topic, is about self-gravity and star formation. What's important for today is for me to show you what happens in that paper. So here you go. You look at the front page of the paper. It looks like just a totally normal paper. You start scrolling through the paper. And you notice that on the second page, there's this funky button that says, click to rotate. And you say, huh, OK, let me zoom in and see what goes on. Huh, let, me, let me click that, uh, click the figure, yeah, uh-huh. And then if I start playing with the figure and I click and drag, you notice I can actually move the figure uh, directly inside of the PDF. And not only that, I can look at various pre-made views, turn off structure that isn't self-gravitating. I can notice that those pieces are disconnected from each other. I can look at the other silly structural decomposition of the data and notice how silly it is compared to the much better one that we published on the left. Okay? And then I can wish, actually, that those graphs below that actually describe the same data were somehow connected to the graphs above. But I'm not going to show you that in this video because, in fact, we didn't do that in 2009. But I'll show you later how you connect those kind of statistical graphics below to the more literal representations um, above. What I want to tell you now, though, is going to foreshadow this great story that I hope I'm going to tell you at the end of the talk um, about how um, little tricks like that, like publishing a 3D PDF, can get people's attention and move the whole community forward. Okay? And that's what we're hoping to do, actually, in most of the seamless astronomy efforts. So in this particular instance, what happened is Josh Peake over there, who's now a Hubble Fellow at Columbia, um, saw this uh, uh, trick, shall we say, of the 3D PDF in nature. And he said, that's great, but you know, they had this $1,000 software from Adobe to be able to do that. And by the way, the reader, the free reader, can, can manipulate the, the graph when you're done. It's only, you only need money to make it in the first place. But he said, I don't want anybody to have to have money. Um, let me see if I can find an open source way to make a 3D PDF. And in fact, he did. And because, how many people know about Astro better? Raise your hand. That's good. OK, that was half the audience, for those of you on the webcast who can't see. OK, it should be 100%. OK, if you don't know what Astro Better is, it's a wonderful blog that has all kinds of tips and tricks like this, as well as interesting discussions um, about the astronomy community. Anyway, so, uh, so Josh comes up to me at the AAS that year in, in 2012, and he says, Alyssa, I'm so excited. Here, look, I made a free 3D PDF, and I'm going to write it up for Astro Better. And, and here it is, and since then, Several people have been able to use uh, free tools to make a 3D PDF. So there's the actual foreshadowing uh, where I'm going to tell you an amazing sequel to that story okay, that also involves Josh Peake in a few minutes. Okay? And I'm going to explain what all those other icons are and how these tools fit together. But before I do that, I want to go back to this publishing story and the world that we uh, live in today. So a lot of data are locked up in journals. Okay, so in other words, you read a journal article and you say, wow, that's a nice image or that's a nice spectrum or I wonder how that compares to my data. But you basically just have some sort of PDF image if you're lucky. And over there is Alberto Akamatsi, who's instrumental to the story I'm about to tell you, which is about ADS. He's nodding. Yes, we lock up this data in our journals. What should we do about it? Okay, here's what we should do about it. You should appreciate that 
many images come from journals. And so here's that background image that you saw um, in the, the complete example. That's an ancient image from Barnard from the very early 20th century that you can see in this online catalog of, of Barnard's images that you can find on the web. You can also find it um, in an article in the Astrophysical Journal, which is stored in ADS. Now, some of you know this trick, but I'm betting not all of you. Did you know that you can move that image to Flickr and then see where it goes on the sky? How many people knew you could do that? Those of you who've heard about this before, but not many. Okay, so watch. So you move that image to Flickr in this particular case. You put it in a group called Astrometry on Flickr. Then there's this wonderful program um, from our collaborator David Hogg and friends called, including Doug Finkbeiner if he's here, uh, um, called astrometry.net, which is a, let's just call it a magical, wonderful computer program for the moment that identifies stars in the image, compares them to a catalog, figures out uniquely where that image goes in the sky. Okay? So that runs in the background on Flickr, puts some comments on Flickr. You can click on one of those comments that says open in Worldwide Telescope, and then that image will open in a web page showing you whatever imagery you want in the background because Worldwide Telescope can change the imagery in the background. So let's say I wanted to put that image over a WISE image. It would look like that. Okay, so what is the ADS All-Sky Survey? Part of the ADS All-Sky Survey is an effort, which is now uh, quite underway and a lot of it works, um, to suck all of the images out of all of the journals in the ADS and put them through this kind of pipeline and let you see them on the sky. And we can share with you um, the early results from, from that uh, effort of putting the images where they go. But there are two other parts to the ADS All Sky Survey, one of which is finished, and this one is just beginning. So I'll get to the finished one in a second. But the other one is really fun. So I mentioned um, the Zooniverse earlier, which is this suite of amazing citizen science projects. So we have a new collaboration with them where what we're going to do is for the images that don't have stars in them. You can't use this magical astrometry program, but humans can read off the coordinates and the captions. And if you have enough volunteers, you can actually collect the information of where these images should go on the sky, regardless of the fact that they have no stars in them. Okay? So they could be some you know, peak intensity of CO emission, like this image here on the right. So this project is called Old Astronomy. And what will happen? Is these images will go out and be served to people who are willing to help. And the entire corpus of images in the Astrophysical Journal and all the other journals in ADS, you'll just click on them in ADS and you can put your image back on the sky or you can suck it out with coordinates and compare it um, to your modern data or to other data. Okay, so I said that there were three parts of the ADS All Sky Survey. So the first part is this so called astro referenced images done automatically uh, through astrometry.net. And then the second part is uh, this old astronomy effort. And then the third part, um, which is now working and you can go try, will actually give you heat maps of where the sky has been studied for what reason. Okay? So in other words, this, this image here, and that's what you were seeing in the slideshow in the beginning, is not any image of the sky. It's an image of articles on the sky. Okay? And you can actually filter the articles by various subjects. And uh, two people in the audience who deserve tremendous credit for this are Gus Mensch and Chris Beaumont, who uh, helped make the viewers and collect all the data. And many thanks to the ADS team uh, as well, as well as our friends at Worldwide Telescope and Aladdin. So you can see the results. You can see these heat maps in both Aladdin and uh, Worldwide Telescope. And in the future, uh, you'll actually also be able to extract them and do whatever you want with them. But right now, you can go to adsass.org and actually see why this guy was studied for what reason. OK, so that's how we can take the past and suck it into the present. Okay? What I want to show you next is how we can actually go um, to the future. Okay, so this is the so-called riveting sequel. All right, what happened? What happened was our same troublemaking friends, okay, including Josh Peake here, who I hope is watching, okay, uh, attended this meeting called Dot Astronomy. So Dot Astronomy 5 was here in September, and some of you in the audience were there. That is a meeting of people who are interested in using online tools and the online environment to advance astronomy research and education. And it was started by our friends at the Zooniverse, but it has spread 
worldwide. And so, again, our group was lucky enough um, to host it uh, at the Microsoft Research Headquarters last fall. And all of these people and many others uh, were in attendance. And they got to talking about what would happen if you combined a bunch of the tools that are described here. And how would that affect the future of what people could publish to go way beyond just having a 3D interactive PDF. And before I tell you the rest of that story, I have to tell you a little bit more about the software involved. And the most important thing, other than that computers are not as good at people uh, as people at recognizing patterns, that I want to stress today is the value of what I'll call linked view data visualization. And what that means is when you have a graph and a graphic, a map, a chart, a diagram, anything, and you have one open and another one and another one and another one, and the same data are portrayed in all of these, if you'd like to actually select some subset of the data or some phenomenon in one that should be transferable to the others, you want to visually be able to see that instantly. And I'm going to show you some examples of the value of that. And then I'll explain how that leads to this new software called Glue. So let me just play this early video made by uh, Astronomers often visualize 3D images by looking at individual 2D slices through the cube, as is shown here. Unfortunately, these 2D slices provide a limited context for uh, three-dimensional hierarchical structures inside these images. An alternative approach is to provide multiple views of the same data set such that interaction with any particular view affects the appearance of other views. For example, this plot shows the same data depicted as a tree diagram. Individual lines in this diagram correspond to structures in the image. And by highlighting subsets of this diagram, I can get a sense of their spatial location in the cube by looking at the slice view. Furthermore, by selecting multiple nested structures in the dendrogram, I can get a quick overview of nested structures inside the data. So this is the same kind of 2D slice movie that I showed you before. But there's more. Another way to visualize this data is the scatter plot, which shows on the x-axis the intensity of each structure and on the y-axis the area of that structure projected onto the sky. Again, I can select a subset of this graph and have the points that are selected here update in real time on the other views. Finally, I can render all of these structures as surfaces in a 3D representation of the data cube which provides probably the best overview of the topology of structures in the data. By interacting with multiple views in concert, you get a better sense of the structures in the data that any individual view can't provide. Okay, so that was a few years ago as a prototype um, in IDL. And I'll come to the present in just a minute. But let me explain that Many of you know who John Tukey is because he invented the fast Fourier transform. Okay? But John Tukey was a great statistician who was tremendously interested in data visualization, and in particular, this kind of so-called linked view data visualization. And in the 1970s, when he started working on this, the kind of live interaction that you just saw, even with just point-based ASCII data, was not possible with um, modern computers. And actually, there's a great video of him and his custom-made device with 47 buttons to be able to rotate data in various directions because you realize the mouse had not been invented in 1977 um, when he started working on this. Anyway, stories aside, what I'm talking about is you just saw an example of you know, what happens if you have some 3D data, a 2D view of the same data, some kind of data abstraction like those trees that you saw, and some kind of statistical measurements like you saw in the XY plot in, in the previous demo. What you want is to be able to live select and segment the data based on uh, what you see. And of course, you want to be able to also extract whatever it is that you do. And you want to combine these visual selections with perhaps algorithmic selections. And so systems to do that are, um, are not many. Okay, But there is one way to do it now. And I'm curious, how many of you have ever run 
a suite of programs like Aladdin, Worldwide Telescope, and TopCat together connected by something called SAMP. It's going to be like two people. Yeah, okay. Three people. Okay. And the problem is that this kind of thing is possible now, and if you really know what you're doing and you're dedicated, you can do amazing things. Now, I'm curious, how many people have ever used just TopCat on its own? That's about eight people. You should all go home and use TopCat. Okay? So TopCat is an amazing catalog manipulation tool that for point-based data, you can do this kind of interactive selection and do all kinds of fancy uh, cross-matching. But what's important is that these software programs can talk to each other. Remember I talked about mashups? So SAMP is like a little connector that lets these programs talk to each other. And if you are playing with a catalog in one tool and then you want to see what it looks like in images on another tool, you can just do that as a live update. But most people don't know that you can do it. And while it's not very hard to do it, there's a learning curve um, associated with uh, trying to use it. So here I'm going to show you a new Lewis program. designed to make Whoops. it easy to compare related data sets in a research project to uncover. I'm going to show you this new program in a minute, and Chris is going to talk to us again in a, a narration. This program is called Glue, okay, which is a new attempt um, completely uh, using Python for the moment um, to provide exactly the kind of link view data visualization I'm talking about. But in addition to um, just the visualization aspects of it, the reason it's called Glue, to get back to the wide data point, is that you can actually import many data sets at once without munging them into one giant file and tell the program what the shared attributes, for example, coordinates are within the different data sets, okay, and have those all interact with each other. So um, I should tell you that I'm very happy to announce that GLUE has been funded um, by the um, uh, James Webb Space Telescope uh, effort at the um, Space Telescope Science Institute, and the idea, which you'll hopefully see why, uh, is that GLUE is going to be very useful for IFU data as well as other forms of uh, spectral line cube data and many other things. We've used it, for example, to plot a cholera epidemic. But let me uh, show you this astronomical example from Chris. GLUE is designed to make it easy to compare related data sets in a research project to uncover relationships among those files. Uh, for example, I've loaded several files of the Perseus star forming region, which I'm showing here is a couple of images and a scatter plot. Um, if I want to create another visualization of one of these files, I sim simply select which file I'm interested in and drag it into this visualization area. I can choose what kind of visualization I want. Um, here I'm going to select a scatter plot. And once the plot exists, I can customize it. For example, I'm interested in comparing the IRAS derived column density to the total emission in 13CO along each line of sight. After I have these visualizations, Glue um, allows me to drill down into my data sets by highlighting interesting subsets of these plots and seeing those selections propagated across all the visualizations. For example, there's generally a correlation among these two quantities here along this line, um, but there's also a cloud of outliers that I'm interested in over here with, that have relatively bright IRAS values and relatively faint uh, CO values. If I select these points in this plot, I can see that selection propagated to all the other plots. Um, and interestingly, I see that these points are not um, distributed uniformly over the image, but they're um, tightly correlated in kind of an arc in this image. This image is showing in green column density derived from IRAS, and in blue, the temperature derived from IRAS. And I can see that these selected red points correlate pretty well with this shell of high column density material. If I blink this on and off, you can see that it lines up pretty well. Um, you can also see that this shell is um, surrounding a relatively low density, high temperature region. This is actually a cavity cleared by a young star and it's heating up its interior. And we can also see that if we look down here um, at this comparison between extinction derived from 2 mass and extinction derived from 13 CO, that these points are also outliers in this plot. In particular, the 13 CO seems to be underestimating column density in this region um, compared to the 2 mass data. This is actually a 13CO data cube, and I can, actually, I can slide through the different velocities of 13CO emission to see if this feature lines up with anything morphologically in 13CO. And I see it really doesn't. This isn't a feature that um, is traceable by 13CO. It really is a, an IRAS column density feature. So just for reference, this, as far as we know, is the only linked view data visualization tool that currently works um, that includes uh, image and uh, cube capability. So now I've almost told you enough to finish this story. Okay? I haven't told you what Authoria is. 
So Authoria is an online publishing platform that was developed here uh, largely by uh, Alberto Pepe, who was our postdoc in the Seamless Astronomy group until a few weeks ago uh, when he became an entrepreneur uh, trying to interest you in Authoria. Uh, but now uh, let me show you uh, how all of this fits together. And I'm going to rely on another movie here at this point made by Josh Peake, but I should point out that what I'm about to show you is a collaboration among principally the people that you see here um, that combines glue, D3PO, which you will hear about in this video, and Authoria. And remember what I said about mashups. Remember what I said about tools seamlessly connecting to each other. I want to give you a new way to explore and explain your data. I call it the story and the sandbox. It's the story you want your data to tell and the sandbox you give your readers to explore it. First, let's start with the data itself. I think we're all probably familiar with this kind of data. It's tabulated data here shown in a CSV file. Um, but by itself, it's not really telling us very much. There's not really much of a story that's going with this data. So first, we want to explore the data. And here we're going to use this tool called Glue. Glue allows you to make these linked brush views. We can select parts of the data. Here I'm selecting the Galilean moons discovered in 1610 uh, by Galileo. And now I want to look at all the other moons and how they might relate to it. So I can kind of build some kind of story. So here I'm sort of learning that these inner moons um, have low eccentricities and inclinations, whereas some of these outer moons may have higher inclinations and eccentricities and likely are unrelated to the kind of thing we see in the Galilean moon. So this is giving me some kind of sense of how these data relate to each other by looking at this linked brushed view of discovery year, mass, and so forth. Now I want to write a story. That kind of thing isn't going to give me much um, to tell a story. So what we want to do is actually make a sequence here where we build the ideas one at a time. This is something you might be familiar with and maybe different panels of a figure. Um, but here we're actually having different kinds of selections. Um, available to the viewer. Now that we've done this building of a linear story, we want to put it inside of a sandbox using this code called D3PO. All we do is export it from Glue. I'm going to save it here as Beyond Galileo. And it's going to give us this nice interactive view that our readers can use. So we'll click on here and it's going to tell a linear story um, about discovering these, about how mass is important for the discovery, and how there's these different range of moons. But this whole thing is going to be interactive which allows our readers to explore the data, to build hypotheses and, and interrogate. And finally, we want to be able to publish this in a way that everyone can see it. To do this, we use Authoria. You can see we've now embedded this same interactive figure inside Authoria, where we can add text and make a full document. There you go. By the way, um, Authoria, I believe, is about to be um, adopted as an experiment by uh, the Astronomy and Astrophysics Journal as a way at least for authors to interact with referees, if not for the papers to be directly published online um, using this kind of interactive tool. So I think I've made my point um, that I think that the future is uh, largely online. Um, but I'd like to make a second point, this little but here. Uh, we need not to lose it. Okay, So I am not so naive as to think that if we put everything online, this is great. We can do all this interactive, amazing stuff, and that's all we have to do. Okay? Because I truly believe that we will lose everything um, if we do that right now uh, using the systems that we have. So actually, this is a picture of my office when I was originally preparing this talk with little pieces of paper stuck all over the table, and I was moving them around because that's still better than even the biggest screen I have. Okay? So I, I, I still believe, you know, here's Sidereus Nuncius in, in the analog world. Um, but this transition is inevitable um, to a completely online ecosystem. And so we have to really figure out uh, systems for, for not losing our data or our work. And the Dataverse project is something that uh, Gus has talked about before and that you can hear more about from Gus, I'm sure, in the future. And there's this video here where I accidentally made up the term acid-free digital record. Um, but it's actually kind of a good term. And right now, we don't have an acid-free digital record. So these are wonderful tools. Um, but you should use them in conjunction with analog tools uh, that can preserve what you do. But meanwhile, the more 3D data that we have, uh, the less these analog tools are going to help us. And so, for example, um, ALMA data is inherently 3D. Uh, there have been some wonderful visualizations in another program called YT of ALMA data. And I already mentioned 
uh, that glue is a part, a very big part of the software ecosystem for understanding um, the future IFU data from JWST. Okay, so a little bit more about the future. Part of it is that there are new devices and new ways to interact with your data that don't involve a mouse and a cursor. And uh, what you see right here is a very famous person who I shall not name, but standing in our visualization lab across the street using Worldwide Telescope with her hands. Okay? And that's because some of you have seen that we have a Kinect set up over there, and you can navigate the universe uh, with your body. Now, that's nice, but it would be even better if you see down here, you see some medical visualization data in someone's hand. And what you'd like is to be able to manipulate 3D data. Okay? There is no 3D selection. There is no 3D mouse. You always go like this when you talk about 3D data, but there's basically nothing that can track your hand with high enough resolution yet for you to be able to use your hand to interact with 3D data. But that's coming soon, and you'll notice the logo down here says Leap Motion, which is a device you can actually buy, but it's not really high enough resolution yet to be able to manipulate data. Um, now, we're very interested in medical data, and I want to use one more example just to show you one more time that visualization is really beyond just picking the right color so that it looks well or picking the right dimensionality um, so that you can uh, you know, make your data look nice. It's really about understanding what's going on. And so I'm going to give you a one slide summary of what is a really brilliant paper by uh, Michelle Borkin, who's a graduate student who works with Hans-Peter Pfister in the engineering a school here and me, and who's giving a job talk at Wellesley right this moment. I hope she gets the job. Anyway, um, this is a one slide summary of a very important paper that she wrote about uh, the effects of dimensionality and color on medical visualization. So this is some arteries uh, in a real person's heart. This is a model of uh, data uh, from medical imaging. And the color code here is showing you basically places where it's dangerous um, in terms of what they do is they model the blood flow inside of this actual system of arteries and places where the blood is having trouble flowing are shown in red. That's a vast oversimplification of what this is, but that's good enough for now. Okay? And what um, a medical professional would be doing is looking for those bad regions. And shown this way, which was the way that they were showing the data before Michelle came into the project, um, the people, since you know the ground truth because you can simulate this, there's 39% accuracy in recovering the bad regions, and it takes 10.2 seconds per region to find them. So Michelle came in and said, well, there's this problem with occlusion, which is where the 3D is blocking the data behind it. So what if we just unwrapped the outside of those arteries and made these 2D plots? Well, then it would look like this. But then the doctors came along and said, well, that's ridiculous, because that's not what the anatomical structure of the arteries should look like. You've got to lay it out again and move the arteries around. And not only that, while you're at it, why don't you make the diameter or the width of those strips match the diameter of the artery so you can also see which are wide and which are narrow. So this was better. And each one of these represented an improvement in the accuracy um, and the speed per region. But then you see it says color brewer down here in the, in the corner. It turns out that humans are better at interpreting certain color schemes than others. And there's a lot of research in the psychology community about that. And one of the color schemes that's good for this kind of data is this so-called diverging red-black color scheme. And when you just change to that color scheme and this 2D view, okay, you go from this 39% accuracy to 91%. Okay? And when 10.2 seconds per region, 2.4 seconds per region. So yes, visualization can save lives. Okay? Now, does that mean that you don't ever want this 3D view? No, it doesn't. Because if you're actually doing surgical planning, you actually want to see both. And ideally what you want is exactly the kind of linked view that I showed you with glue a few minutes ago, where you can have both 3D view and the 2D view and other views at the same time. So the last couple of things I want to say um, have to do with education and, and, uh, and the future of what we can do there. And so um, I've mentioned Worldwide Telescope several times. I think I've given whole other talks about Worldwide Telescope other times at the CFA. But let me just tell you that in terms of using programs like that, and this is just a screenshot of what the program looks like, what the main interface looks like, using that in educational settings, um, we, through this ambassadors program, have had phenomenal results. And we've collaborated with the science education group here to do this. I'm not going to tell you all about this graph. I'm just going to summarize it. Um, with a quote from one particularly otherwise difficult, according to his teacher, teenage boy, who said, it's cooler than Call of Duty. So ask me more questions about that later. And instead, I want to mention a new opportunity that we have here at Harvard, 
So some of you came um, last spring to this little demo fest that we had of interactive modules describing important topics in interstellar medium physics that were made by the graduate students in the interstellar medium course here. And these are just screenshots of each one. And what they did was delve into a particular topic uh, well enough to figure out how you would want to explain it to another graduate student or to an advanced undergraduate. And then the requirement was that they use some kind of visualization tool, hopefully that would translate well to an online environment, to explain it to more than just their peers, but to the whole world. And one of them, this last one here, is actually about to be deployed inside of the Harvard X edX um, teaching system where people can just adopt that in their online courses as an interactive module. And actually several other ones are eligible for that kind of treatment as well. And so I really think that it makes teaching a lot richer um, if you can involve that kind of interactive visualization in, in how you teach. So this brings up a different question, right? edX and things like that, even Worldwide Telescope. Worldwide Telescope is free, by the way, but developing Worldwide Telescope, of course, is not free. And uh, creating all the data that are in it, not free, but already paid for. Okay? So this what can we afford question under challenges, it's not <coughs> as bad as you think. Okay, if you change your priorities because of this ability to plug one thing into another, okay, and because of the widespread availability, availability of huge amounts of online data, often you just have to add a little money okay, to make something a lot better. But that's not usually been the priority. People think about visualization, and data interaction, uh, technology as, as some kind of luxury or something that you do really for communicating with the public. But I actually think um, that as these data sets become bigger and wider, it's much more important also for communicating uh, with ourselves. And if we're going to do that, we have to teach people how to do that. Okay? And then we also have to think about this, this issue um, that comes up in software more generally, not just visualization software, where you know, instrumentation, you build a big telescope, I'm looking at Charles here, you build a big telescope and then you have to pay for the instruments um, afterwards and they often cost just as much as the telescope, if not more in some cases, and you have to keep maintaining them. Well then you have to build software for all those instruments and for that telescope, which don't cost, doesn't cost as much as the instruments, but has to cost something. And we have to train people to do this really well and to use it really well. I mean, no offense to all of you, but SAMP can do amazing things. And like three people in the whole audience know that it exists. Okay? So we really have to train people to know how to use these tools. Okay? And one way to do that is there are people who are really interested in this stuff. You've seen their pictures um, on the slides a lot of times. And sometimes they're lucky and they're also interested in something else like me and they can keep doing this as a hobby. But we really need a career path for people who are specifically interested in data science and visualization. And in industry now, data science is one of the hottest jobs out there. Okay? And so we need to, I think, make it that way um, in science as well. And it is in biotech, but it's not yet in astronomy. Okay, and the last couple questions are about customization. So again, in biotech, for example, there are these very customized modules that are absolutely beautiful for doing a particular thing. But we in astronomy often want a very flexible environment and we do different things. And so there's a hard question to think about how much we want generic tools versus very specific tools that do one thing. And then how do we preserve these tools um, to use them in the future? Hopefully the answer is you make them open source and you have enough people working on them that they migrate constantly. And then there's a sort of a political question. You notice I haven't mentioned the virtual observatory. The virtual observatory has been extremely essential for making the infrastructure that makes a lot of this possible. Okay? I think that they maybe went a little bit too far in trying to sort of orchestrate everything and make all of the tools themselves and not embrace the community effort enough. And I think now we've gone too far in pushing the kind of infrastructure off to the side and just wild west making all of these tools. And so I think what's needed is a, a partnership between an orchestrated uh, organization, maybe funded by the government, and this kind of wild west um, that I'm showing you uh, that lets you make uh, the diversity of tools that can plug together into this kind of seamless environment. And I will stop there. Thanks. Great. And we have some time for questions. Sure. So, so you, you hinted at this at the, at the end, but what about um, 
uh, how long any particular success in this can last. Right? So, you know, we have a book. If it's acid-free, you have a book 100 years later. Um, but how many files can you read that were created 20 years ago, let alone, or even 10 years ago? So that, yes, that is a huge problem. And, and so, for anyone who didn't hear, Charles was asking um, about the longevity of these tools and, and of the data sets um, and how they um, interact with each other. And that is a big unsolved problem. And so the problem is that it's a problem that isn't going to go away because people are going to just keep making these things anyway. And so my answer is that it is true that very popular open source software, like Linux itself, for example, right? There's enough people participating, it gets kept fresh, and old versions get kept, and it actually all still fits together, right? It's these little niche things where there's just kind of one person working on it, and then, oh, it doesn't work several years later, right? And so what you really need is um, kind of an invested community. And then standards are not unimportant, okay? And so if there are enough standards that are lightweight enough that people can um, actually adhere to them, things last a lot longer. In other words, you can open a web page from 20 years ago. You know, HTML is the same now in terms of opening a 20-year-old web page as it was then. You could not use the browser from 20 years ago to open a you know, Flash page now. You can't open most Flash pages now anyway. <laughs> anyway, okay. um, anyway, so that kind of backward compatibility is, is easier if people are paying attention and the software keeps getting used. And so, I mean, that's why I really think, you know, I was on this, National Academy has a new board on research data and information, and in that board several times this kind of question came up. And a lot of times, like four or five years ago when we first started talking about the solution was we need more data scientists and we need more people from the library community and the information science community to pay attention to this problem. And they are paying attention to this problem. And there are data scientists now, especially in the industry. But I would say we need to pay more attention to them. Yeah. I'll go one. Go um, so we have these nice tools for uh, dealing with, quote, big data. Mm -hmm. When do we get the tools for dealing with things like the bastard child of astrophysics or astronomy known as solar physics is dealing with, which is huge data? Ah. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 when Gus was talking about Dataverse, I said, yes, yes, let me give you some data. And, you know, he, he ran away screaming. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just from SDO, we get about two terabytes of data a day. And if you're doing a research project which involves, you know, half a rotation of the sun, 28 days, and you want all the images in one wavelength, you can imagine how much data is one simple project. Data from ATST usable products one day is going to be about 15 terabytes. Yeah, and so I have an answer to that. Um, of course, part of the answer is it's hard, okay? But another answer is that what seems to be necessary, kind of like that example where I showed you with the medical imaging where the doctor said, no, 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 that's ridiculous. You don't want to lay it out that way. You want to lay it out this way because it's anatomically correct. You have to, for some level of kind of data reduction, if you will, rely on the community itself to make something that's kind of manageable. <coughs> and Chris and I were having this conversation just the other day. So there's an effort that we're also peripherally involved with um, that has to do with ALMA visualization of large cubes. And then we're dealing with the um, uh, space telescope I have few data, which is very small compared to what we normally do. And we were talking about like how do you separate the manipulation of these giant ALMA data cubes behind the scene from the front end visualization tool. And it, it probably is going to be necessary. So it becomes sort of a different problem to manipulate the data and get it to the point where it can actually be sensibly visualized. But uh, Chris, do you want to say anything more about this? No. No, <laughs> thank you, Chris. Well, I mean, it's, 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 it's like a hardware problem at some point. Right? Like you get to a point where it's large enough. I think some of the wide data stuff is tantalizing because it's almost small enough to kind of like fit in our computers and fit into RAM. And so we think about like, how do we deal with it? When you get to terabytes a day, you have no choice but to keep it in a data store and think about, you know, industry grade uh, data warehouses. Well, one of the, the hard things is, you know, there, there are other virtual observatories, you know, not from the dark side. Oh, like the solar virtual the, like yeah. the virtual solar yeah. observatory. Um, where one of the issues we have is even the simple representation of somebody does a search and they want to return metadata. When you're getting millions and millions of records returned, how do you represent that in a sensible fashion which gives people the ability to select out the data they're wanting? Even something as simple as that without even going to yeah, the Yeah, I'm glad you asked. So, so there's this whole community of so-called information visualization. Um, and they love examples like that. 
And so I should just mention that when we did have this initiative in innovative computing here on campus that, that Gus mentioned, that was exactly the kind of thing we did. We, we went and found an information scientist at U and uh, tried to put them together and let them do a project together. And now there's this thing called the Institute for Advanced Computational Science, which is an indirect descendant of, of our other institute. And um, that is in the engineering school. And so what I would actually seriously kind of do is to go talk, anybody here, go talk to my friend Hans-Peter Fister, who's now leading that in the engineering school, and say, I have this problem. You know, and that is an interesting enough problem that you could get an information scientist and an information visualization person to, to give you some sort of tools that are better than a word cloud. Any online questions, Chris? No, okay, we're good. Uh, one more, Chris. I have a follow up to Charles's question. Um, so, even if you solve the problem that um, all the interactive visualizations are somehow retained, so you can look at them in 20 years, yeah. like Java applets from like 10 years ago are almost embarrassing. So, like, they just feel dated. Yeah. Um, and it seems like these kind of interactive things haven't like converged to like a stable aesthetic. And so, do you worry about? that problem that even if we can retain them, we won't want to use them because they're going to look so 2000. You know, I was looking at some 10-year-old PowerPoint slides of mine recently <laughs> that I thought were really slick 10 years ago. I was like, oh my god. And so, I mean, to some extent, I think it's a fashion problem. Yeah. And so, I don't know. I mean, yeah, I guess maybe the fact that the 1895 FJ was just like the 1665, you know, philosophical trends, maybe that's a good thing. Yeah, it stays um, out of the way, right? It does stay out of the way. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think the answer is do it now, but be embarrassed later, and that's okay. Yeah. Well, maybe we should let people have cookies, and uh, feel free to come play with the ADS Small Sky Survey if you'd like. Thanks for everything.